Hello, and welcome to another Growth Masters Federal presentation. Growth Masters Federal is a nationwide community of growth-oriented government contractors, their owners and executive teams, and the professionals who support them. The purpose is to share experiences and discuss timely topics on planning and executing the most effective growth strategies in the complex, highly regulated, but opportunity-rich federal marketplace. Your host is Shirley Collier, president and founder of Scale to Market. Scale to Market helps businesses think, plan, collaborate, and prosper in the federal marketplace by developing and executing data-driven, customized business development playbooks. What is my business worth? When should I sell and what steps can I take now to ensure the highest possible return on the years of hard work I've put in? What strategies exist to minimize the taxes associated with selling? How does the sector I operate in affect long-term value? Does my 8A designation help or hurt when it comes to finding buyers and setting a value on my business? As with just about everything else, the factors that determine the market value of companies in the federal sector are unique. Shirley's guest today helps companies answer these questions and works with them on navigating the long road to successfully closing out that final chapter. Michael Ottomanelli is a senior financial advisor and vice president at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. Michael's experience working in the tech industry before moving to the financial sector combined with extensive financial planning credentials and experience make him a valued and trusted full life cycle advisor to principals of small, high growth federal contractors who want to maximize the value of their company and prepare for the day when it's time to cash out and move on. Today's topic is exit planning for small federal contractors begins on day one. And now here's your host, Shirley Collier with her guest, Michael Ottomanelli. Enjoy the podcast. Hello, Shirley here. My special guest today is Michael Ottomanelli. Michael is a former tech executive turned financial advisor, a rare combination, who now works primarily with technology companies and government contractors. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Shirley. It's a pleasure to be here. Michael, please tell our audience a little bit more about what you do for a living. Sure. So I actually came out of the tech sector. So uh, you know, I started out in software, uh, did that for about 13 years. And um, eventually I decided to, to go over to financial services. Uh, this is about 14, 15 years ago. But obviously with the intent of working with uh, tech companies and government contractors. So that's sort of my niche. What I've done is I've developed into a full life cycle advisor. So I'll work with companies, uh, you know, kind of get in with them uh, when they're just getting going maybe in the, the $1 or $2 million stage, and really work with them to get them through uh, all the different stages. So if they're in that first stage, we'll try and the next stage is to get them to $5 million. Then the next one would be to get them to $15 million. And then eventually, you know, we are going over their exit plan and trying to get them to uh, maybe 20 or 30 or $40 million so that they can sell the company. And we're really just looking at all their different infrastructure, so everything from their financing to their... Uh, 401ks, government accounting systems, and then, like I mentioned, all the way up through their, uh, importantly, the exit strategy. Excellent. Michael, what I like about what you do is that you take a very strategic, holistic view of financial planning for the owners and managers of your client companies, sort of a cradle-to-grave concept. Our topic today is exit planning, so I'd like to start with some definitions. Exactly what is an exit plan? Sure. Well, simply put, um, most of my clients have you know, started their business to be their own boss and build wealth for them and their family. And so the question eventually arises, you know, how are you going to eventually monetize uh, this business that you're building? And that's what becomes your exit plan. Yeah. Uh, monetizing is very important. I mean, why else would you put in 60-hour work weeks for 15 years or more. So tell me what a plan typically consists of. Well, you know, what I typically tell folks is this is your magic number, right? So that, you know, they come to me and um, they have some sort of number in their mind. And so the exit plan is a, is a roadmap on how to get there. 
Um, now, we can come at this from either direction. So what I found in an experience is that my older clients, you know, in their 50s and 60s, um, they tend to have an idea of what type of income they'll need in retirement. Um, so we'll start there, and then we'll just reverse engineer it to get it up to, well, what's the company sale price that we'll need to generate that income? Uh, conversely, with my younger clients in their 30s and 40s, they seem to already have a sale price in their mind. So they'll think, okay, well, you know, we're looking for 20 million or 30 million. So we'll start in that, you know, in that direction, and then go ahead and figure out, well, you know, what kind of retirement income is that going to correlate to after uh, transaction fees and taxes and, and so on. So is this something that is written or is it just discussed? It can be a little bit of both. Um, usually first it's discussed and then it eventually makes its way onto paper uh, one way or another. So, you know, from the business standpoint, um, it might get reflected in their one, three, or their five-year strategy plan. Uh, from the personal standpoint, the financial part would be reflected in a comprehensive financial plan that we would put together that would capture all the numbers from the exit planning discussion. And then finally, the succession or legacy part, uh, that would get executed through their estate plan. Now, what do you mean by succession or legacy? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, these people are going into business to build wealth for them and their families. So whereas some owners, you know, they're just looking for the simple life and they want to just be able to provide for them and their spouse, others are thinking about the next generation. So uh, with enough money, we can do things like setting up charitable family foundations and dynasty trusts, you know, in their name. And those things will go on in perpetuity, and they'll help provide for their children and then even their grandchildren. That makes a lot of sense. So why do I actually need a, a plan? Why can't I just kind of keep something in my head and not really share it with others? Well, I mean, you know, as in most things, the, the old adage applies, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, in my experience, uh, this thing can really veer off of the beaten path very quickly um, if we don't keep an eye on the end goal. And so that really requires you to have a, a tangible, planned out end goal. Now, there are so many uncertainties in starting and running a small business. How can you possibly develop a plan on how you're going to sell in, say, 10 years? Well, considering that, the say, the 8A program is about nine years, um, I'd say 10 years is a bit long. Um, most of my companies I work with are already a ways along in the program, or they have a few years left before they size out of their small business standard uh, based on their name. So I would say that most of our exit plans are really for a runway of about less than five years. Okay. Now, most people procrastinate. Uh, what would you say to someone uh, if they say, why do I need one now? Why can't I just wait and see how things go? Sure. What I always tell them is that, that the sooner you know where you're going, the, the less wrong turns or, or backtracking that they're going to make along the way. So early on, it is really good to know your plan. Uh, so you can make certain infrastructure decisions, like uh, do I hire a sitting CFO or an outsourced CFO? Um, a sitting HR person or an HR consultant, etc. Can, yeah, can you give me an example? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, some of the common mistakes that I see, um, one would be uh, being infrastructure heavy. So um, some of the contractors I meet, you know, they've come out of a booze or a Deloitte, and, um, you know, they're used to process and infrastructure, and they figure they should build their business the same way not realizing that, you know, they're only a $5 million company right now. <laughs> so, you know, they're doing $5 million in revenue, and they're paying a sitting CFO, and they've got Dell Tech, uh, you know, and they've got all this infrastructure when they could have just as easily been DCA compliant with QuickBooks and a good virtual CFO. So, you know, their overhead is way too high. It's either cutting into their margins or it's affecting their rates, which ultimately affects their win rate. Yeah. Other issues I see a lot of are um, contract mix, you know, so they're too high of a percentage of uh, set-aside work. Uh, for instance, like a company that's doing $30 million in revenue with all 8A contracts or small business set-aside, 
unfortunately, that country, that uh, company is virtually worthless because there's very few companies that can acquire them. And then I'd say another one I see a lot is uh, too many chefs. You know, I've I've engaged with companies where, you know, we'll sit down, we'll talk, and they're like, okay, well, we have four, you know, four or five principles. And I'm just, I'll just tell them right out, right, you know, that's, that's too many chefs in the kitchen. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, all of these types of issues, it's really better to deal with them uh, sooner than later. Michael, let's elaborate on a few of the points that you just made. Many small business owners are not aware that small business set-aside contracts have little market value. Yeah, I do come into this one a lot. Uh, Basically, small business and uh, 8A set-aside contracts, you know, they build cash flow, but they don't build value. Um, The whole idea of those programs when they were set up is really to get you started in the industry so that you can eventually go on to compete uh, in the full and open space. Um, But many contractors become complacent or they never really quite learn how to compete in uh, full and open. And so, you know, the rule of thumb for acquisitions is about a 4X, meaning... Uh, if you're doing, say, $20 million in revenue, it's going to take a company of about a size of about $80 million to have the means and, and the cash to be able to acquire you. And so obviously that business will not be a uh, small business or an 8A at that point, and they, they can't take over those contracts. That's a really good point. And, you know, I might add that as a federal business development consultant myself, that I see small businesses being faced with a dilemma And that is investing in business development activities to get their companies to the next level. Many businesses start with the founder doing business development. And then if he or she is successful and the company wins a contract, now they jump into contract delivery and there's no business development taking place anymore. So how do you advise your clients about investing in growth? Yeah, this one is, is very important and, and also very tricky. Um, I'd say probably the three, you know, sort of main paths that I see from that point that you're talking about, you know, onto the next stage would be uh, go out and hire a full-time BD person. Um, go out and outsource your, your BD to a experienced person or an agency. And then the third being the, the player coach model. So that's where an experienced BD person comes in and is doing the BD for you initially, but really with the intent of showing you how to do the BD and and set up a a BD infrastructure. Um, And then eventually they'll move on and and you you have the means and the the process in place to to do your own BD. Um, You know, most importantly, just with, just as in exit planning, uh, business development is obviously crucial. Uh, if you have a well-researched and, and well-thought-out plan for how you're going to bring in more revenue, then you're, you're more likely to execute and see results rather than just submitting more proposals or relying on luck. Um, so obviously, I know this is your more of your area. Yes, I see the same factors in play in my practice. Thinking, planning, executing, and constantly evaluating your business's results our best practices in the BD realm as well as in the exit planning realm. So what are some of the unique characteristics of the federal marketplace that contractors should keep in mind as they're contemplating an exit? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would say that so typically uh, company sale pricing begins with a, a multiple of EBITDA or net profit essentially. Uh, so a company that's doing about $15 million in revenue and, say, they're doing 10% margins, they begin with a multiple of about a 4X, uh, meaning that's going to put them at a, about a sale price of about $6 million. Now, that's just the starting point, essentially. So then any additional value drivers would be assessed, and they would use those to either kind of move the needle up or down from there. So some of those value drivers that I've seen are, um, again, margins. You know, so what, what percentage are your margins? Are they good or are they very thin? Uh, prime versus sub. So are you uh, primarily priming or, you know, are you doing a lot of sub work? Uh, what sector are you in, right? So you could be doing help desk IT, something very commoditized, or you're, you know, you're in cyber, which is a very sort of hot sector right now. 
what agencies are you in? You know, are you working with EPA or are you working with DHS or Intel? Um, like we mentioned earlier, contract type. Uh, so uh, are your contracts full and open or are there a lot of set-aside work? And then, you know, your contract mix. So one of the things that they'll look at is um, recompete timing. You know, if they're coming in looking to buy a company and all of their contracts are up for recompete in, the, say, the next year or so, um, well, that's risky, right, as opposed yep. to, well, we just want a few five-year contracts and we've got a nice long runway ahead of us. Yep. Um, so those are just a few of them. There's actually about 10 different value drivers that they look at to determine if they're going to adjust, um, you know, that sale price up or down. So it's important that business owners early on understand what's going to drive the value of their business so they can begin addressing these factors early in their life cycle and not wait until a year before they want to exit. Exactly. So let's say that a business owner has... um, uh, that they've they've hired you to help with this, and they have a good plan. Um, how often does that plan need to be updated? Well, with my process, you know, what we do is usually about once each year, uh, when the, the government fiscal you know starts to wind down in September, um, we'll usually sit down and meet in, in you know, October, November timeframe, and that's our opportunity to really assess, you know, how do we do for the year. And then, you know, reassess our exit plan based on uh, how we did and what we see coming down the pike for the next fiscal. What are some of the factors that would necessitate the plan to be reassessed? Well, certainly uh, any new contract wins or uh, conversely any losses along the way are going to cause us to uh, reassess. Um, sometimes, you know, as things are going, you'll get um, changes in ownership. So, again, back to my, my guys that have four or five principles when we started, and now, you know, a few years later, we're down to two or three principles. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're going to have to make some changes if there's a, a change in ownership. Uh, maybe you have to um, push out the exit plan or speed things up. Like uh, for the last example, um, you know, health concerns. So sometimes we have an exit plan in place, but the house just doesn't, you know, it just isn't there. So we say, okay, well, you know, even though we were thinking about selling in five years, uh, due to my house, I think we're really going to have to move up that timetable, and it'll have to be two or three years. Uh, So any of these things can really cause us to uh, reassess. Yep. So, Michael, in your experience, um, what have been the benefits that you have observed of, uh, for your clients of having an exit plan? Well, you know, later on, it's, it's good to know your plan so that we can make um, advantageous financial decisions. Um, things like uh, setting up a residence in Florida to avoid paying state income tax on the sale, or uh, maybe putting some shares in a trust prior to the sale to save capital gains tax on a portion of the sale. Um, so, for instance, you know, with the Florida thing above that I just mentioned, um, to be really, you know, legit in the eyes of the IRS, we really need to do that about a, at least a year in advance of the company sale. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of these guys think, oh, well, I'll just move to Florida like a month before, <laughs> you know, the, the sale and everything will be fine. It's well, not that you know, easy. No, Virginia will track you down <laughs> and they'll look for their taxes. Um, so, you know, things like that are definitely better to be doing in advance. Uh, trust planning as well. So, uh, you know, if we're going to, say, do some sort of trust and, and put shares into that trust, well, with that, the less the company is worth when we put the shares into the trust, the less taxes we'll pay upon the sale. So, you know, it's actually more advantageous to do that sooner than later. The sooner we figure out that's something we want to do, the, the better it is for us from a tax planning perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly what is your role, Michael? How how do you help businesses? Well, you know, simply I work with the principals to to understand their specific circumstances, and then I help them to lay out a plan that's, you know, both intelligent and achievable. And then I'm a big hand holder, so, you know, what I do is then hold their hand through the whole process of executing and then eventually realizing that plan. That's, that's great. So you don't just develop the plan and say, here, have at it. 
you're sort of with them throughout the process. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, so, Michael, as we are wrapping up here, what would you say is the biggest mistake that small federal contractors make when planning for an exit? Uh, well, I mean, as you can see from what we discussed, I think, you know, simply not having one. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's pretty succinct. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for your incredible insights today. Very informative for federal contractors of all sizes. Folks, if you would like to get in touch with Michael, he can be reached at Michael underscore Ottomanelli at ML.com. That's Michael underscore O-T-T-O-M-A-N-E-L-L-I, two T's and two L's, at ML for Merrill Lynch.com. Or you can reach out to us at Skelta Market and we'll make sure that you're connected. This is Shirley Collier signing off for now. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on how to grow your business in the federal marketplace, visit our website at scaletomarket.com. That's scale2market.com. And subscribe to the Growth Masters Federal Channel on Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join us again soon for another informative Growth Masters Federal podcast, and have a great day.